Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Annie R., current editor and previous editor. <clears throat> I'm going to read several different selections. The first from Tolstoy's Kreutz's Sonata. For those who don't know that infamous tale, it's one of an older man who marries a much younger woman. The older man is looking for a sexual partner. The younger woman is looking for a spiritual partner. They marry and both are disappointed. Neither finds what he or she was looking for, but they make a go of their marriage anyway, have a couple of children, and after a number of years, one of the husband's old friends shows up who happens to be a musician. He's a violinist, and the wife of the narrator plays the piano. The friend and the wife begin making music together. The husband encourages that. But over time, he becomes increasingly jealous and convinced that they are making more than music together, that they are making whoopee together. They are not but there is certainly an erotic current in their relationship. The husband goes away on a business trip, comes back intentionally a day or so early, and sneaks into his own house and finds his wife and his friend having a little tete-a-tete supper after having performed some music. He assumes that it is post-coital meal, it is not. They have just been music, music making, which is what Tolstoy says. But he is so jealous that he proceeds to stab his wife to death as a result. His, on her deathbed, he says to his wife, confess. She says, I have nothing to confess, I'm innocent. He, he, he bullies her until she still says to him, I have nothing to confess. She dies, he realizes the error of his ways, and he then proceeds to tell strangers, perfect strangers, who will be willing listeners to him, the tale of his awful murder and mistake. Um, it's a bit like Coleridge's Rime of the Ancient Mariner, where the penance which the narrator faces is having to retell the tale over and over and over again. This is the tale. Tolstoy's wife, Sophie, had to copy that story over and over again for her husband. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the world, she was writing her own versions of that story, in which she told the whole thing from a woman's point of view. These were finally published in the year 2010 in Russian, and I got permission from the family to translate her stories into English for the first time. So the book that was published contains his original story, Tolstoy's Kreutz Sonata, two stories by the wife in response to Tolstoy's story, and a story by their son, who disagrees both with his father and his mother. <laughs> What I'd like to do tonight is read a short excerpt from the Kreutzer Sonata by Tolstoy, and then two very short excerpts from Sophie's response, the untranslated, previously untranslated, unpublished works. So this is from Tolstoy's Kreutzer. He emitted his strange sound several times and drank some tea. The tea was terribly strong and there was no water to dilute it. I felt especially stimulated by the two glasses I had. The tea must have also had an effect on him because he became more and more excited. His voice became more melodious and expressive. He kept shifting his position, taking off first his hat, then putting it on again, and his face kept changing in the semi-darkness in which we were sitting. Well, that's how I lived until I was 30 never for a moment abandoning my intention to marry and establish the most sublime and pure family life. With that goal in mind, I inspected every suitable young woman, he continued. I wallowed in the filth of debauchery, 
while scrutinizing young women pure enough to be worthy of me. I rejected many of them precisely because they weren't pure enough. At last, I found one I considered worthy. She was one of two daughters of a landowner from the Penza province, who'd once been very wealthy, but who'd fallen on hard times. One evening, after we'd gone for a boat ride and were returning late at night in the moonlight, I was sitting next to her, admiring her shapely figure, her tight-fitting sweater, and her curls. I suddenly decided that she was the one. That evening, it seemed to me that she understood everything, everything that I was feeling and thinking, and that I was feeling and thinking the most sublime things. In fact, it was only that the sweater suited her so well, as did her curls. And after a day spent so close to her, I wanted to get even closer. The astonishing thing is how complete is the illusion that beauty equals goodness. A beautiful woman says stupid things. You listen, and you don't see the stupidity, only the cleverness. She says and does nasty things, and you see only nice things. And when she doesn't say anything stupid or nasty, and is a beautiful woman, you immediately convince yourself that she's a jewel of intelligence and virtue. I returned home in ecstasy and decided that she was the height of moral perfection and therefore worthy of being my wife. I proposed to her the next day. What a mess it is. Of a thousand married women, in our, not only in our class, but unfortunately even among the peasants, there's hardly one who hasn't been married ten times over, even a hundred or a thousand times before his marriage, like Don Juan. Everyone knows this, yet pretends not to know. In all the novels, the hero's feelings are described in detail, as well as the ponds and the bushes they stroll past. But in describing their great love for some young woman, no mention is ever made of what's happened to the interesting hero before. Not a word about his visits to those houses, or about the maids, or the cooks, and other men's wives. If such indecent novels exist, they're never given to those who need them most, that is, to young women. At first, they pretend to those young women that the profligacy filling half of our towns and even our villages doesn't really exist at all. Then they get so used to the pretense that, like the English, they finally come to believe sincerely that we're all moral people and we all live in a moral world. The young women, poor things, believe this in all seriousness. My unfortunate wife also believed this. I remember how once, when we were in, already engaged, I showed her my diary in which she could find out a bit about my past life, primarily about the last liaison I'd had about which she might hear from others, and about which for some reason I felt obliged to inform her. I recall her horror, her despair and bewilderment when she learned and understood. I saw that she wanted to leave me then. And why didn't she? He emitted his sound, fell silent, and took another sip of tea. No, anyway, it's better like this, he cried. It serves me right, but that's not the point. I wanted to say that it's only unfortunate young women who are deceived here. Their mothers know this, especially those who have been schooled by their own husbands. Mothers know it perfectly well. Pretending to believe in the purity of men, in fact, they act quite differently. They know what bait to use to catch men for themselves and their daughters. You see, it's only the men who don't know, and we don't know because we don't want to know. Women know very well that the most sublime poetic love, as we call it, depends not on moral qualities, but on physical proximity, on hairstyle, the color, and the cut of a dress. Ask any experienced coquette who's given herself the task of captivating a man which she would rather risk. To be convicted of lying, cruelty, even dissoluteness, dissoluteness in the presence of the man she's trying to charm, or to appear before him in a poorly made, unattractive dress. She'll always prefer the former. She knows that we all lie constantly about our lofty feelings. We really need only her body. Therefore, we forgive all sorts of abominations, but we won't forgive an ugly, tasteless, or unfashionable dress. The coquette knows this consciously, but every innocent young woman knows it unconsciously, just as animals do. That's why those vile sweaters exist. 
those bustles worn on behinds, those bare shoulders, arms, and, all, and almost bare breasts. That's Kreutzer's Sonata. That is the piece to which Sophie takes exception. Shows the male take on women's sexuality, love, marriage, etc. Now here's from Sophie's story entitled, Whose Fault? When she raises the issue of culpability in her marriage. And it's a description of Sophie's relationship with her husband, the prince. And the arrival in this house of the prince's old friend. So we have the same sort of triangle set up as we had in Kreutzer Sonata, the husband, the wife, and the friend. And here we have the husband, the wife, and a friend. The prince spent the whole next day at home with his old friend, showing him the estate and recalling old times, those youthful years when they had become friends and lived the same kind of life. Bikmetyev, that's the name of the friend, Bikmetyev left, left towards evening, and the prince, after bidding a cold farewell to his wife, went to catch up with the hunt. They had sent word to him that the whole group, hunters and dogs, would be spending the night at his neighbor's house and old bachelor landowners and would expect him there. Bikmetyev came back two days later. The prince was still away on the hunt, while Anna, in low spirits, was home all alone. She was very pleased to see her guest. She blushed and was somewhat surprised that she found Bikmetyev's presence so very pleasant. Excuse me, princess, for coming to see you again. Your cheerful family life attracts a lonely man like me. We're very glad to see you, Dmitri, said Anna, but we're occupied with things that must be very uninteresting for you. Very interesting, little Pavlik intervened. Look, look, Mama, look how splendid. Show him. Anna opened an album in which an impressive variety of dried flowers was beautifully arranged. There were bouquets, wreaths, and figures of the most unusual shapes and combinations. Incredibly lovely. It's obvious that you're an artist, princess. Well, Pavlik, let's you and I make something amazing. Everyone began working again, and the evening passed quickly and merrily. When the children went off to bed, Bikmetyev picked up a book from the table and was surprised to see that Anna was reading such a classic author, Lamartine. Princess, he said, why exactly did you decide to read this work? By chance, she said, I'd never read him before, and now I'm taking great pleasure in it. If you don't mind, read some aloud to me. Gladly, Princess, I'd forgotten him altogether. Anna took up her work and sat down next to a lamp, experiencing a strange feeling of happiness and serenity. She really didn't appreciate loneliness. On occasion, she glanced up at the lean, earnest, beleaguered face of her guest, at the tightly stretched skin on his high forehead, and the sparse black hair on his temples. And she thought, no, he's not putting on airs, as it seemed to me earlier. He's unhappy, and he must be a very fine man. Bikmetyev read to her, quote, night is the mysterious book of meditations for lovers and poets, only they know how to read it. Only they possess the key to it. The key is the infinite. That's just where I stopped, she said. It's in the commentary. I like it very much. And the relationship of night to the infinite, he said, is astonishingly poetic. If one doesn't believe in this infinite, it's terrifying to die. I'm now going to skip a few pages and move to another, another part to get the sense of this relationship. When her husband came in, he assumed a conciliatory tone. He approached her, smiled, and embraced her in silence. Anna regarded this truce serenely and unresponsively. This husband is getting jealous, too. At that moment, she felt so spiritually alone, so remote from that which interested him, that when he extended his arms to embrace her, 
she didn't understand at first what he wanted. Only when it became clear why the prince sought to make peace with her so quickly, she suddenly found him repugnant. She quickly withdrew from his arms and she cried, no, no, I can't, not for anything. Everything about the prince seemed unpleasant to her. His handsome face seemed coarse and stupid. His yellowing teeth, graying hair, and passionate eyes had all become loathsome. She lay down, blew out the candles, and turned her face to the wall, pretended to be asleep. Having recited the Our Father quickly and inattentively repeating it over and over and over to make it more conscious, she crossed herself, and with a tormented soul, she fell into a troubled sleep. The prince's jealous outburst soon passed. He wrote a note to his friend, inviting him to come to dinner. And by the time Bikmetiv began visiting them once again, the prince had calmed down completely with regard to his wife. His friend's tranquil, noble behavior could in no way give rise to any suspicions. His chivalrous politeness, propriety, and respectful admiration of Anna lacked any traits that could arouse the prince's vicious feelings of jealousy. Meanwhile, Bikmetiev completely yet imperceptibly entered Anna's familial and personal life. He took walks with her and the children. He played with them. He spent time with them, recounting interesting stories or drawing with them. Sometimes he had them sing or dance, and they become so attached to him, they became so attached to him that they were bored when he didn't come and visit. As for Anna, she never felt so happy, and her life had never been so full. An atmosphere of love indiscernibly enveloped her on all sides. There were no tender words, no crude caresses, nothing that usually accompanies love. But everything around her breathed tenderness, and everything in her life was filled with affection and happiness. She constantly felt that a sympathetic eye was following her through life, approving everything, admiring everything. Here endeth the reading. Now for something entirely different. This is from a translation of Crime and Punishment, that is a work in progress, commissioned by Norton for a trade edition first and then a new Norton critical edition. I see my research assistant, Matthew Blake, is here uh, and is helping me with this project. Um, I'm going to read a very short excerpt from the translation. It was part of what appeared in that Russian issue of the New England Review. It's taken from part one, chapter two. It's interesting to note that the original title of Crime and Punishment was The Drunkards. And it's a scene in which, Mar in which Raskolnikov, the hero, has just done a little rehearsal of the murders that he is about to commit. That is, rehearsal in the sense that he walks the path, gets to the place where it's going to happen, and pawns something with the pawnbroker, whom he is later to murder. He leaves, and on his way back to his apartment, drops into a tavern where he encounters somebody he doesn't know, a retired civil servant who is already inebriated. And this retired civil servant has been looking for uh, somebody to tell his life story. And he decides Raskolnikov is the man. So he sits down and he relates his entire life history to poor old Raskolnikov. And then, somewhat unexpectedly, launches into what I think of as the first sermon in the novel in which the religious themes are announced for the very first time and then are developed for the next 400 pages. So this is referring now to Marmaladov. His name is Mar based on the word marmalade, Marmaladov, who's sitting in the tavern and drunk. Marmaladov wanted to refill his glass, but there was nothing left. The bottle was empty. Why should anyone feel sorry for you, demanded the tavern keeper, who turned up next to them once again. 
There was a burst of laughter in the tavern and even some cursing. The listeners laughed and cursed, and even those who weren't listening joined in, simply looking at the sorry sight of the former civil servant. Sorry? Why feel sorry for me? Marmaladov cried suddenly, standing up, his arm outstretched, now genuinely inspired as if he's waiting for those words. Why feel sorry, you ask? No, there's no reason to feel sorry for me. I should be crucified, nailed to a cross, not pitied. But crucify me, O judge, crucify me. And after having crucified me, then feel sorry for me. I myself will come and ask to be crucified, for it's not joy I seek, but sorrow and tears. Do you think, O oh shopkeeper, that your bottle has afforded me any pleasure? Sorrow, sorrow is what I sought in its depths, sorrow and tears, and I found them, and I tasted of them. But he who has pitied all men, and who has understood everyone and everything, he will take pity on us, he and no one else. He is the judge, and he will come on that day and he will ask, where is thy daughter who sacrificed herself for the wicked and consumptive stepmother and for a stranger's little children? Where is thy daughter who pitied her earthly father, a useless drunkard, and who was not dismayed by his beastliness? And he will say, come forth. I have already forgiven thee. I have forgiven thee once. Thy many sins are now also forgiven, for thou hast loved much. And he will forgive my Sonia, he will. I know that he will forgive her. Just a little while ago when I was with her, I felt this in my heart. And he will judge and forgive everyone, both the good and the evil, the wise men and the humble. And when he has finished with everyone, then he will come to us. Come forth, he will say. Even ye, come forth, ye drunkards. Come forth, ye weaklings. Come forth, ye shameless ones. And we will all come forth without shame, and we will stand in front of him. And he will say, Ye are swine, ye are made in the image of the beast, and ye bear his mark, but ye, ye also shall come forth. And the wise men and the learned men will exclaim, Lord, why do you receive these people? And he will say, I receive them, O ye wise men. I receive them, O ye learned men because not one of them hath ever considered himself worthy. And he will stretch forth his arms to us, and we will kiss his hands, and he will weep. We will weep, and we will understand all things. Then will we understand all things, and everyone will understand, even Katerina Ivanovna, his wife. Even Katerina, she too, she too will understand. O Lord, thy kingdom come. Deep in thought, Marmalada sank down on the bench, weak and exhausted, looking at no one, oblivious of his surroundings. His words made quite an impression. Silence reigned for a moment, but soon the previous laughter and curses resumed. Know it all, damn liar, bureaucrat, so on and so forth. Let's go, sir, Marmalada said suddenly raising his head and turning to Raskolnikov. Take me home, to Kozyol's house, in the courtyard. It's time to go, to go home. Thank you very much. Thank you.